so my name is Elmer Seta. I've been uh, working in security for about 16 years now. Um, not quite sure when that happened, but you know. Uh, I have done a lot of different things in the industry over the years. Uh, started out doing kind of code audit and web pen test and down in the, down in the salt mines. Um, I've spent most of my time working at consultancies. Uh, previously, uh, Bishop Fox, IOActive, kind of various places around the industry. Um, spent a few years doing kind of field support and uh, strategy and operational security consulting to news organizations and NGOs that were being targeted by nation states. Uh, spent a year as the security architect for Etsy.com. And now I'm kind of out on my own again. Uh, have a little company called System Structure Limited, uh, mostly focusing on architecture and strategy consulting for small to mid-sized engineering teams. Um, so I want to talk to you today about why you should completely overthink everything that you do in security instead of relying on checklists that make your life easy. Um, and the reason I want to do this is because checklists always have limits, right? There, there are always things that aren't on the checklist. There are always mistakes there. Um, but it's not like even if you just added more and more items, right? You know, you'd never get all of security. It's not that security is just an infinite list of unrelated items. Um, security is about things that happen in context. Um, you get bugs when you don't understand what your users are trying to do, when you don't understand the traps that the tech stack that you've decided to build on is setting for you, right? When you don't know how to combine primitives in that stack to meet your objectives. We'll get back to what an objective is. Um, when you don't have processes that find those errors. And when you try and make decisions with, uh, in places where you don't have the context to make those decisions. If you don't have a kind of principle-centric approach to how you think about security that lets you actually reason from first principles, you are always going to end up walking into some of these mistakes in different places. Um, you may get lucky a lot of the time. However, in my experience, and this may be biased because I spent all of my time thinking about this, but in my experience, it is easier to work from first principles than it is to remember everything that should be on the checklist. So I want to start with what security is, because there's a common misnomer, because we call the field computer security, that security involved computers. Um, it does involve computers, but kind of only tangentially. Security is the set is the likelihood or the set of activities that reduce the likelihood of some adversary frustrating your users' goals in the world. This has nothing to do with software with computers unless your users happen to be using software to achieve a thing that they care about in the world, right? Bank security has to do with moving money around, not with SQL injection. SQL injection is only interesting in the context of banks because it might involve money or data or other things that banks deal with. Um, so it's useful if we want to think about security in a rigorous way to be able to think about what, um, like what those goals actually are. Like how do, we, how do we make that concrete so we can actually work with it? Um, so this is a little chunk out of a larger, uh, a larger talk about threat modeling. Um, when I talk about threat modeling, I mean something a bit different than what has um, kind of come to pass as threat modeling in the industry. Um, so I'm not interested in can we tamper with this variable. I eventually am. But what I'm primarily interested in with threat modeling is capturing the problem that software is trying to solve and the security structure of that problem. So when we think about, so when I talked about security objectives, this is where we get a security objective, right? So we create, and this, because this isn't a threat modeling talk, this is the very abbreviated version, we create a matrix like this that says, yeah, you've got, um, you've got uh, a user who is trying to create a comment, right? That's CRUD, create, read, update, delete. Um, you've got a user who's trying to create a comment. And they shouldn't be allowed to create a comment in this context, right? So that's an elevation of privilege bug. Or you've got an admin who should be able to delete a comment and isn't able to delete a comment. That's a denial of service bug. Basically, at the level of thinking about what people are supposed to be able to do with a system 
when tied to things that they're trying to do in the world, that's all you have. Everything is either elevation of privilege or denial of service, right? You're either stopping someone from doing something they should be able to do or letting someone who should be able to do something do something they should, or uh, flip that around, whatever. You know what I mean. Anyway, what this gives you is a list of everything that can go wrong with a system at the level of the system in the world. Um, and so once you have a list of that that's kind of in priority order, you can do rankings, you know, course bucketing. You're not, this isn't, this isn't rocket surgery. You're just trying to get a rough idea to help you think. Um, so you can create a list of the things that you want the system to do if something, if something is trying to go wrong, right? If, if, an, if some adversary is attempting to make something go wrong, right? When some person who's an actor in the system, even if they're like an anonymous internet user, um, attempts to make some bad thing happen, um, you know, post a comment when they're not supposed to be able to post a comment, then the system should respond by doing something sensible. Um, they might prevent the attacker from launching the attack. I don't know, maybe the system shows up at their, at their mom's house and scolds them. And, you know, then the, the attacker never tries to launch the attack in the first place. Um, they can stop the attack from working, right? The permission system blocks the comment from being posted, um, which is not the same thing as preventing the attacker from launching the attack. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, we can't, you know, like if it's a, if it's a, spe a suspected DDoS attempt, yeah, we'll try and rate limit it. We should probably tell somebody that we've seen this thing going on. Um, sometimes we're just gonna detect and log it. Um, we might wanna do multiple ones of these things. Sometimes we wanna alert somebody that like, hey, it looks like something weird is going on. Um, but that's, that's basically what our kind of, what our set of responses looks something like that. Um, when you create a list of all of the security objectives for a system or a component or a subsystem, it means that you have an understanding of what you're actually trying to build, right? This is, this is part of your spec for the system, is how it should behave when someone tries to do something bad. And if you call all of those things out in a coherent, coordinated way, how many people here have seen a design doc template that had a, a security section in the back of it that was always blank? Yeah, I see a few of you have also seen design doc templates. Um, the, the reason why everybody leaves them blank is they were basically, you know, it's like, okay, the system shouldn't be vulnerable to SQL injection. Well, yeah, we know that, right? Like that's not, why, why should we write that down? I'll tell you why you should write that down later, but um, it's, or when you should write that down. Um, it's not actually useful, right? Like people don't, if you don't have some structure to think about the problem, you don't know what to put in that part of the template that is actually useful for the engineer who's gonna then go and write that code. This is what you put in that part of the template. Um, so to build a secure system, understand your user's goals and the context and the strategies that they're going to adopt using your tools, right? This is critical. Um, your users are trying to accomplish a thing securely in the world. They will do things, possibly really weird, unpredictable things with your tool based on their lives, their context, their understanding of the problem and what they think your tool does and how they think it works. If you don't understand what they're going to do and how they're going to use your tool, you have no chance to design a tool that will actually support them in the way that they're going to use it. Um, some of this may be like figuring out how to make your tool more transparent so they can understand the ways that you've kind of encoded thinking about security in it. Um, there's a, there's, a whole, there's a whole pile of stuff, and we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, you also need to understand the invariance that your system needs to maintain and the behaviors that you need to enable to let their strategy succeed. We'll talk about invariance in a minute because they're a big part of the structure of how I want you to think about security. Um, we need to understand the lower level behavior of our tech stack. And in particular, we need to understand the places where we need to act in a certain way to either preserve that low level behavior or eliminate vulnerability that is intrinsic in the way that that um, tech stack has been implemented. Then we need to figure out how to deploy our primitives in a way that satisfies all of this. We need to test to make sure that we actually did it correctly because you didn't. There's always bugs, that's fine. This is why we test. And then we iterate. 
Um, and part of the iteration there is figuring out not, okay, we tested, now we developed some more code, now we tested it again. It's looking at, hey, did this thing actually solve the problems that the users had in the world or not? If you don't know whether or not your tool solved your users' problems in the world, you should probably figure that out. Um, we'll talk about how. So invariance. Um, how many people have heard of this trio of confidentiality, availability, and integrity as kind of, these are, these are the security principles, right? Everything in security comes down to one of these three things is the thing that we are repeatedly told. So these are a few interesting invariants. They're useful. Here are a few other invariants that we might care about in the context of real world systems. Don't worry, I'm not gonna talk through all of these. Um, many of these are not relevant in many cases. However, I am gonna talk through a few of them because it turns out that having a richer toolkit of ways of thinking about, of principles of thinking about um, the systems that we build drives a lot of different kinds of behavior that gets us away from that checklist mentality. So the first thing I wanna talk about is efficacy. Um, efficacy is, does your system actually do the thing in the world that it was supposed to do? Um, how do we get efficacy? Well, efficacy in part is a product design question. Um, how many people have a design team at your company? How many people have engaged them in the security life cycle? Awesome, I wanna to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> uh, it's super rare. Uh, security has been slowly working its way up the stack. First, we had to convince sysadmins that, hey, maybe you should think about the security thing. And then we had to convince developers. And then we had to convince architects. And now we're sort of working on the business people. Um, and then after that, I think we'll maybe get to the design teams. Um, however, you know, when we talk about, so your users have strategies in the world. The design team are the people who understand whether or not your product is serving them properly, and they're the people who can understand and speak to what those strategies are. Um, they determine the security outcomes that your product actually has to an incredible degree. Engineering determines if you reach those outcomes, but design determines what outcomes are possible. They determine the scope. Um, if your team is big enough, product security design is its own discipline. You need to speak the designer's language and you need to come to them. And that's, a, you know, it's a pretty different tribe. Um, if not, you can bring consulting security designers in, except that isn't really a field yet, but there are a few people who are working on it. If you have this problem and you're ready to actually start doing it for real, talk to me. Um, I'm happy to help. Um, part of what this means is it means designing for human error, right? It is humans who are using our systems. There's always some funny gifts in here because it's too early to not have them. Um, so your staff or your users click on things for a living. That is literally what they are paid to do. They are paid to sit at a computer and click on things. Um, getting them to not click on things while they are working at speed is impossible because they click on things for a living. You cannot yell at them and stop them from clicking on things because clicking on things is their job. You cannot cajole them to do this. You cannot train them out of clicking on things because clicking on things is their job. Instead, your job is to make clicking on things safe. Um, if you can't make clicking on things safe, consider goat farming. It's great. The goats are assholes. They're still gonna do stuff they're not supposed to, but it's funnier. And you know, the goats don't really care. Um, but seriously, designing for human error, this is an entire discipline. Um, but there's a lot of things, like the obvious one is fishing, right? You know, we have, we have fishing is an entirely self-created problem. We created a massive security vulnerability. We still haven't fixed it. Um, we'll get to that more later. Um, correctness, next principle. Um, correctness bugs in software tend to have security impact at some point. Maybe you get lucky, maybe you don't, right? If you have workflows that are not properly documented, you have no idea whether or not they have bugs. Like say, I can just set the price of the stuff that's in my, in my shopping cart. That's a great workflow bug, it's, it's really lucrative. Um, you probably don't wanna have that one, you should maybe hire a QA team. Uh, how many people here have a QA team at your, at your, not as many hands as I'd like? I've noticed that a lot of folks have kind of stopped, like, oh, we, we test, you know, devs do the testing. They sort of do the testing. They sort of do the testing until it's a ship deadline. You know, maybe they wrote some unit tests. Do you have coverage? I mean, you think you have coverage, but do you actually have? Yeah, um, hire a QA team. 
Um, if you're starting on a big security push, start a QA push at the same time. That way your security team isn't gonna be doing your QA work. Um, it'll make everyone way happier. Um, so, bug mitigations, right? This is, this is the, the mitigator, right? The mitigator mitigates vulnerabilities until it can't see any more vulnerabilities. It raises the bar. Um, this is Hal Harflake's cartoon. Um, when you have bugs that you have, so, well, we've got a statistical mitigation for it, right? It works most of the time. It doesn't work. It does not fundamentally work. Um, you know, so this is, this is a lot of the tools that we've tried to use for buffer overflow. This is, I'm going to search all of my incoming input for things that look like cross-site scripting because I'm probably going to catch, oh, they got to put a script tag in there somewhere, right? No, they don't have to put a script tag in there. Um, so you catch it until you don't, right? And the thing is, when you don't, when you run out of steam in that mitigation, it means that you can't see the vulnerabilities anymore, by definition, right? If you could still see the vulnerabilities, you would write code that, that mitigated those vulnerabilities as well. So as long as you were in this mitigation-centric mindset for trying to patch bugs and playing whack-a-mole, you were guaranteed to fail. So this is maybe not the mindset we want. Instead, we'd like to maybe kill bug classes. That's not a real spider, don't worry. Um, if you are doing security engineering work and it is not either trying to stop people traversing through your ecosystem or trying to kill off classes of bugs or create mitigations that are not just sort of statistical, you're basically doing emergency response work. Um, Confidentiality, right? This is our next one that you know this, right? So encrypt all the things, authenticate all the things, authorize all the things, eliminate all of the side channels in the things. Um, that one turns out to be super difficult. We made some really big mistakes a long time ago for efficiency, and now they're biting us. Um, this is mostly not your problem, but all of the um, spectrum stuff, that's, you know, uh, this is where it starts getting messy. Um, this is where we need to go back and think about rigor in computation again in a very different way. Um, but confidentiality, we, we mostly understand as, as what we're trying to do. Integrity, right? This is, the, this is another one that we're familiar with. Um, don't let randos manipulate your data. Don't send the shopping cart to the client. HMAC all the things. If you have data that needs actual integrity, maybe store it in a data store that guarantees integrity. Um, you know, like, if you don't want to do that, that's cool. But, eh, you know, reliability bugs turn into security bugs. Um, there are limits to invariants, right? We have these invariants that we're familiar with, like confidentiality. Oh, right, I'll use crypto. Okay, so you write some crypto. No, you don't write some crypto. Somebody else writes some crypto, and then a lot of people test it. Understanding the limits to what invariants you can validate yourself is critical. Um, it turns out parsers, by the way, and a parser is anything that accepts a string. Parsers are as hard to write as crypto code. Almost all parsers that are written by humans have significant vulnerabilities in them. Um, there are no parsers for the ASN1 spec, that's every SSL certificate in the world, that implement the entire spec and do it correctly. They do not exist. Um, also, there are no parsers that implement the entire ASN1 spec and can parse an arbitrary ASN1 certificate, SSL certificate, in a bounded amount of time because it turns out that ASN1 is Turing complete, um, which was a mistake that we'll get to later. Um, understanding where the limits of what you can validate are. If you can't validate a thing and if you don't know that you can validate a thing, either change the problem that you're trying to solve until you know you can validate it or get somebody else in. You know, if you have problems that need novel crypto, I've run into a couple of them, they were a lot of fun, um, get somebody else who's, who actually knows what they're doing to validate that in. Um, so availability, right? This is the other one that we know about. Um, this, the key to availability is to hand your wallet to Amazon and they will make you available. Um, <laughs> and this is almost kind of true, right? Like. For a lot of companies, like, okay, so you set up multi-region deploy, at, you know, and whatever, and failover, and, uh, you, know, you know, churn through all of this stuff, and it mostly solves the availability problem, except for the availability bugs that you write in-house. It solves the out-of-house availability problem. Um, it also massively complicates your architecture. Um, some of this complication is just necessary, like this is, this is complication that is inherent in the problem. 
Um, a lot of the ways that we try to solve availability result in maybe more complexity than they need to. So if you know you need high availability, for instance, you probably want to start thinking about it sooner rather than later so that you don't end up backing yourself into a corner where you end up with an architecture that's more complicated than you need. Um, DDoS, one real exception here, make DDoS somebody else's problem. Um, unless you're a telco or like a carrier, just just don't, or or run more than a few data centers that are just yours. Just make it somebody else's problem. Um, so non-repudiation. Um, when we talked about confidentiality, we talked, oh, just authorize all the things and authenticate all the things. Um, we're really bad at writing authentication properly. How many people here have implemented a service that um, takes in U2F or WebAuthn for 2FA? How many people here know what U2F or WebAuthn are? Awesome. So, yay. Um, uh, YubiKeys? So um, there are two ways that you can, well, there's a few ways you can use a YubiKey, but there are two main ways, right? You either use a YubiKey for TOTP, which is um, when you have the little six-digit code that you go type into the website, right? You can back that to a YubiKey, which is great. Um, the problem with that, though, is that all the phishing attack needs to do is ask you for that string, and then it just works, um, which is lovely. Um, what U2F and, uh, uh, or FIDO, um, and then FIDO2 is the next standard, which has become WebAuthn, um, what they do is the hardware security key actually talks to the browser, gets the SSL channel context that you're talking to the website with, and investigates the, um, I think it's the, I think it's, uh, I, I should have looked this up beforehand. It's basically tied off of the server cert. Um, and if it doesn't recognize that the context for that server cert matches the context that it has for the 2FA code generator in, embedded inside the hardware, it doesn't generate a code. So it doesn't matter if the user is completely fooled. The, the, the token's just not going to do the thing because the token isn't fooled. Um, this is a case of having computers do problems that computers are good at. Computers are really good at accurate string comparison if you're not using C. Um, <laughs> sorry, shade. Um, but, uh, and humans are really, really bad at it, especially when our job is to click on buttons. Um, so this is basically a solved problem now. All we need to do is to get everyone in the world uh, to uh, implement WebAuthn and then get everyone in the world's security keys. We will get there. Um, how many of you have services in your uh, company that offer, well, that provide authentication in some way? How many of you support 2FA in those services? How many of you support WebAuthn in those services? This is your homework. Go implement WebAuthn. It will make your users' lives so much easier. This is literally, this is the number one bug for, uh, for attacking users. If I want to own your complete AWS stack, I take advantage of the fact that AWS still, six years after people, five years after people started yelling at them to implement it, still does not implement WebAuthn or U2F. Um, so all the AWS users are fishable unless you've gotten really lucky. Um, so yeah. Uh, also, there are, there are other things to think about in authorization. Um, did you log enough data to reconstruct what the user did and who did it? Is that, log, is that log file actually tied back to a secure principle in a way that you can trust during an incident, right? And this doesn't mean that like all of your logs have to be, I don't know, like cryptographically signed by a key delegated for the, no. Um, you know, but it, it does mean that you have to actually put the username and pass that through to the back end and make sure that you know where the request came from and who sent it and that kind of thing. Also, SSH. Um, how many of you have prod boxes where you cannot tie keystroke logs back to real humans? Okay, one person's willing to admit that. Most of you probably do. Um, it's pretty rare that I see a company that's really locked at, that down well enough. Um, you want to, you really, really want to. Even if you totally trust all your engineers, you really don't trust their laptops. And they can get fished too. So, unlinkability. Um, people talk about anonymity as a security property. I do not like the word anonymity because nobody can agree what it means. 
um, people tend to be able to agree on what unlinkability means. Because when you say unlinkability, it's, oh, what is, you know, X is unlinkable to Y, right? User IP address is unlinkable to web request, okay? You know, because Tor, whatever, right? These are, you know, this is a thing which you can actually reason about. So if you have places where you need anonymity or you need to um, uh, anonymize data, et cetera, you want to make sure that there is no process by which that data can be linked back to the user again. Now, if you're talking about, I don't know, statistical um, samples of user behavior, et cetera, well, we just strip the user identifier off of them. Well, yeah, but like, it's actually pretty easy often if you have a couple of fixed points in a data set and you can start figuring out who people are. Um, figuring out, thinking about this with some rigor will, will pay dividends if you need to. Um, also, if you don't have content, if all you have is metadata about what the users are doing, that's plenty. Um, for instance, if you give me packet sizes for um, a Skype call, right? Voice traffic is encrypted. Give me packet sizes you can get about an 80% match on reconstructing the voice, on reconstructing what people are saying. Because it turns out the packets are pretty small, and that basically gives you an information density quantization of the voice stream, and that's enough to recover a lot of the data. So it's not just metadata. Um, and if you are providing unlinkability guarantees, be very, very careful about making sure that you really know what you can provide guarantees on and that you communicate that accurately to your users. Yes, they may not catch you. That's not the game you want to be in. So trust. Um, trust is a great thing. We like trusting things. Um, know what you're trusting. Don't lie to yourself about what you're trusting or your users. Um, but what are you dependent on? How many people know all of the dependencies of their production systems? Including the microprocessor firmware. We, none of us do. That's fine. We all live in a state of sin around trust. We, we trust lots of stuff that we really shouldn't trust. Um, it's useful to spend some time at least thinking about where those dependencies are, um, figuring out, you know, what are the services that have all of my data? Do I know what they're all doing? Um, you know, thinking about where does, where does the code um, for these systems come from? Uh, if you have build processes that pull in third-party code, at build time, stop. Um, this will get you owned. Uh, how many people have saw the, the Node NPM library takeover? I think it's happening about once a week at this point. Uh, like seriously, uh, somewhere in the ecosystem. It's a big ecosystem, right? Um, so if you don't have any control over the libraries that get pulled in at build time, sooner or later you're gonna pull in malicious code. Um, there are a lot of ways to fix this. One of the great ways, set up a local cache, make sure that all of the builds go through the local cache, put a two week delay on it. Just you know, pull in, pull in current versions at a two week delay. Somebody else will find the, uh, find the malicious code first. Like this doesn't work if everybody does it, but um, <laughs> so don't tell your friends, but do this on your stacks. Uh, no, but I mean, but seriously, because you know, it, you're basically saying, okay, let's give ourselves some buffer time so that reviews can happen. Um, because you know, that, those changes are getting reviewed, just not necessarily in real time. So just give yourself some time. Um, and then that lets you put a bit more trust on it. Um, to the extent that you can make your build tree something that you can actually trust, signed commits are great. They're slowly creeping towards being usable. Um, make sure that you can verify that code has been reviewed. Binary transparency is really cool. Um, if you've, got the, if you've got the space to do it, especially if, you've, if you do have your own hardware, um, you can do TPM attestation on boot so that you know the firmware that a machine is running. You check that firmware, make sure that it's running the firmware you thought it should be running before you give it the key that unlocks its drives. Um, you can actually build up at this point a pretty rigorous chain of trust through an ecosystem. Um, the extent to which it's gonna be worth doing that is gonna depend on you know, who your adversaries are and, and what their uh, ROI models are. Um, but ideally, we would like to be able to actually say with rigor that, yeah, we know what code is executing our environments. That's sort of the goal that it would be great to get back to. Um, you do not control your users' computers, your end users, unless it's in-house end users. Um, do not pretend that you do. 
If you are in the DRM market, consider a different business model. Um, if you are trying to do secure computation on your users and you are not off in the zero knowledge proof world, in which case you don't need this talk or hope you don't need this talk, uh, then you know, don't trust things that they do. Observability. How many people here are confident that they can tell if their systems have been compromised? So that's normal. Very few people can. Um, this is why it normally takes, I think the average for industry is 210 days to notice a compromise. Um, you know, it's not great. Um, you can get that, you can help be part of bringing that average down now. Um, centralize all of your logs, like really all of them. If you have things that don't log, figure out how to make them log. Um, for instance, like if you're running Terraform, which is great, uh, you know, figure and you've, and you've got people using the Terraform client locally, you can make that log. You can make that log off of their laptops, which should already be sending logs into log centralization if they have rights to run Terraform in the first place. Um, when you get the logging bill, then figure out what you can live without. Um, you know, and, and you may be in a situation, it depends who you're talking to and like where your, where your logs go and stuff. Like I know there are volume constraints. Um, and there's a lot of stuff you can log, right? Um, Go Audit is a great little tool from, I think it was the Slack team originally. Um, it basically lets you plug Audit D into uh, syslog so that you can get every single syscall on a production machine logged, um, which is great because it means that you know, if, uh, if code is opening up a network connection, then you get that log, you get that log line no matter what it's, what it's running as, you know, unless it is actually in ring zero already. Um, you know, and then you have to do filtering and, and that kind of thing. Um, so when you are looking at building out a logging system, the thing that you care about are events, not log lines. Uh, who has dealt with multi-line, with like line breaks in log lines in production? Yeah, they're a nightmare. If you, ha if you are super lucky and you've never had that happen before, especially if you've never had that happen in the history of the, of the organization and the history of the logging stack, when it does start happening, it's going to be a real pain. Um, so just assume that log lines aren't single lines uh, from the start, and that will make your life happier. Um, structure is your friend. Not necessarily a lot of structure, but like knowing what uh, an IP address is, knowing what a date stamp is, et cetera. These are really useful things. Um, if you cannot correlate logs across systems, across parts of systems, for instance, I have my, I have my syscall log entry, and then I have the firewall log entry, and I can't figure out that those are the NetFlow entry, I can't figure out that these correspond to the same network connection, then none of those log lines are actually useful. Um, correlation is hard, setting it up takes some time, designing a logging system instead of thinking of it as an afterthought will save you. Um, time is a lie in almost all systems. Uh, if you get minute level sync, you're doing pretty good. Um, do not, you know, time is not your correlation tool, um, except in very narrow cases. Also, if you do not look at your logs, they don't exist. Um, sometimes this is okay. I want to caveat this. Um, if you know that you will not have time to build out the monitoring and alerting side of your logging system, but you do have time, like right now, but you do have time to just turn on log capture and just start collecting it all. Do that first. Because what you cannot do after you realize you got owned is go back in time and turn on log capture to figure out how long you have been owned for. What you can do retroactively is then start searching those logs to find the indicators of compromise that you missed. Um, so the sooner you start capturing logs, the better. However, they won't actually help you until you look at them. Um, Good indicator of, of writing good indicator of compromise queries is hard. It's literally an entire discipline inside security. Um, that said, do something. Like there's a lot of low hanging fruit. Like if you've got OS query on boxes, run the, the Facebook OS query kind of canned, uh, canned queries. Just get something in there and get it baked into your, uh, your, alert, your alerting system. Um, lots of people want to sell you machine learning for security for anomaly, anomaly detection on logs. It's mostly bullshit. Most of them are not doing anything at all useful um, that you cannot duplicate relatively quickly. Um, if you are looking at 
things where it's like, okay, Amazon has sets of security alerts that they enable. Maybe they call it machine learning now. Whatever. It's not. It's not, right? It is that they see enough log traffic, and they have those people writing indicator of compromise queries. And yeah, maybe there is some modeling in there, but it's mostly that they just see enough traffic that they actually have enough data to know what, oh, this is what a host takeover of via this bug or whatever looks like. Um, you probably don't have enough data for that if you're trying to do roll your own machine learning in-house and it's not, for instance, like fraud tracking on your marketplace if you're running a marketplace, you probably don't have enough data on what machine compromises look like to be able to actually train a model to that. But you may have enough data to write the queries manually. Um, so scalability. Um, often, you know, especially in startup land, we get you know, very steep growth curves. Sometimes you build like, oh, we've got this token parameter space for like every individual query has a GUID and, um, you know, and we, we sort of know like, you know, there's a security uh, invariant around not being able to guess the GUID of a, of a transaction, whatever, and that's great. And then last year we rolled over 32-bit, um, uh, you know, uh, qu you know 32 bits of queries and, uh, you know, we only had 40-bit uh, UIDs and now we only have like six bits left before I can start guessing a transaction. Um, so think about scalability and kind of maybe take some notes when you're building systems if you realize that there is uh, a system that you're setting up that could break at a significant scaling jump um, and just like leave yourself reminders or leave ideally the entire engineering team reminders that like, hey, when we, when we uh, implement our trillion, you know, when we have our trillionth transaction, it's time to go rethink the GUID length. Um, so a lot of what I care about scaling, though, is actually the opposite, right? Um, Auto-scaling database clusters are awesome when you really need to exfiltrate the entire customer database really fast before they catch you. Um, excess capacity is not actually your friend, especially when you're dealing with data that you would like to keep private. Um, you do not want to necessarily support more transactions per second than you are actually getting in. And figuring out how to, how to balance this can be a little bit complicated, and there's definitely some kind of, um, uh, there are some, some trade-offs between simplicity and, uh, and mechanism here. But if you've got a system, especially if it's high value PII, where you can impose artificial rate limits, like, I don't know, you have to hash the query a million times before it'll, you know, submit something, something. Um, this, and especially if then there's humans in the loop or you've got alerting systems in the loop, this can be a way of detecting um, rate or, you know, if, if the attacker is being greedy and often if they don't have a reason to suspect that there's some kind of rate detection in place, um, you can stop that, and often you can have like your support team tell you, "Hey, the like super secret PII database is being really slow today." Huh? That's weird. Let's go take a look at why. Oh yeah, it's because somebody else is using up all of the uh, all the query slots. Um, so predictability. Predictability is a thing that we would really like to have in our systems, um, and in particular, predictability for security purposes ends up meaning a lot of different things about the structure of our infrastructure. Um, so programmatic infrastructure is awesome. Um, it's time that we stopped managing switches as pets as well and, I don't know, AWS accounts as pets. Who here has an AWS account that they don't manage as a pet? It's all Terraform all the time. Um, Ideally, you really want everything to look like code, right? Because code is a thing that you can audit. Code is declarative. Code can be reviewed. Code doesn't have amorphous state sitting in an opaque system that you can't look at in the context of all of your other state, right? The state of your AWS configuration is opaque if it is not des uh, defined and driven from somewhere else. So the more stuff you can make programmatic, the better. Um, this means also that means that you're less likely to have a human being trying to manage 
two different sets of state or three different or n different sets of state and make sure that they all consistently change in the same way um, without forgetting something. Um, and, and honestly, a lot of the systems that we use to manage the state are super user hostile. Like the number of breaches that happen because of misconfigured S3 buckets right now. The reason why that happens is the S3 policy language is a bloody nightmare. It is not designed for human beings. Therefore, human beings should not write it. You should have a computer write that for you. Um, and then you can at least just check correctness once and then specify it in a more human-friendly language. Um, there's also a lot of things that you get once you move to fully programmatic infrastructure. Um, it means that you can do whole different kinds of, of things around segmentation and response. You can cross-check around like, oh, did somebody get access to the CLI and, and make a change directly, right? You know, obviously, you know, if, you, if you've got an interface that you don't ever expect to be used except in an emergency to configure the state of, I don't know, your entire hosting ecosystem and somebody uses it, that should set off an alarm. Um, it means you can do two-person rule for, especially if you've got higher value systems where you always need to have kind of two people in the loop. Um, if you work for, if you do uh, government IT work, a lot of the, a lot of the specs actually require two-person control over um, most infrastructure. And we kind of either do it really, really badly and there's some sort of ticket-based system, but it's actually just one person typing, or we just kind of ignore that rule because it's a real pain. Um, but programmatic, programmatic infrastructure is the way you can actually do that honestly um, and, and not just uh, you know, kill your productivity. Um, don't patch. You should not patch systems. You should blow your systems away completely and rebuild them from a new image that has the changes you want in it. Um, I know we've spent a very long time trying to talk people into patching, and now I'm trying to talk you out of patching. Um, but the problem with patching is drift, right? You end up with systems that are not in the state that you thought that they were supposed to be in. So if you can treat all of your images as immutable, and ideally all of your disks that aren't data disks as immutable if you have your own infrastructure, um, then you don't have to worry about drift anymore. If redeploying is too slow to do this, fix your deploy speed because this will buy you a bunch of other dividends too. Um, ideally, rebooting the world should take eh, maybe an hour unless you've got some long-running jobs. You know, For everything that isn't like a data mining query, it should take maybe an hour and it shouldn't really require paging anybody. Um, so uh, how many people here have heard of LangSec? Anyone? Anyone? OK, so this is basically saying that a lot of the, this is where we get to parsers again, right? Um, writing a parser correctly is really, really difficult. Um, you end up with states that you didn't realize were in there, you know, and, and an attacker just jumps into the middle of your parsing flow and you didn't realize that that was possible, so you didn't write the handler for it correctly. Um, whenever possible, when you have something that accepts a string, use a parser generator and write a little mini formal spec for what that string should be. And then everywhere where that string is emitted, use that code, and everywhere where it's received, use that code. Uh, Hammer is a great library that exists in a lot of different languages for parser generators. Um, this is probably this and uh, writing dynamically mem uh, managed memory code are your two bugs. Like if you have production bugs, these are probably most of them for what's going to get stuff compromised. Um, compartmentalization, right? We're, this is a th you know this is firewalls. We think about firewalls. We're used to firewalls. Um, we fought, we, compart uh, we compartmentalize horizontally between systems, between instances. Between services, how many people here have services in production which can only talk to the other services that they actually need? Great, a few people. So if you have all of these services deployed programmatically, and if you have in that service definition file, which should live in Git, um, a list of all of the other services, you can just literally apply firewalling so that if it's not supposed to talk to an instance of that service, it can't. This eliminates a lot of your horizontal traversal issues. Um, vertically within a system, so privilege separation within a system. Um, temporarily across execution lifetimes. If you've got something on the internet, 
it should probably not live for more than about five minutes. Um, if you have stuff internally that doesn't need to live for too long, it probably also shouldn't live for more than about five minutes. Five minutes is a goal. Um, but basically, this means that if an attacker gets onto a host, now they have to keep getting onto that host, right? They can't just sit around for 12 months, slowly exfiltrating data and being very quiet as they move through your network. And assuming that if you're lucky, that, uh, that bug that they use to get onto that host generates a log line somewhere in there because something's going weird, right? Now you get that log line every five minutes and maybe it climbs up your stats tree and eventually somebody in the ops team will be like, what is causing this weird, like why does Nginx keep crashing on this box? And then they find that attacker. Um, uh, service discovery, like whatever, there's a bunch of tooling here that makes, uh, makes your life a lot easier. Um, jump over some of that. Uh, separation of concerns. Um, engineers are human. Again, designing for humans. Uh, the fewer things that your engineering team needs to be thinking about when they write a given piece of code, the better. Um, separate your system into layers. Make sure that you understand the security guarantees that each of those layers can provide. Make sure that they're real guarantees. Um, and then the engineers don't need to think about the things that are outside of their layer, right? So ORMs are a great example of this, right? You have, a, you have a, an ORM, it handles all of your database transactions. Now your engineers do not need to think about managing SQL injection code, assuming your ORM is written properly, when they are writing the rest of their code. That's, one, that's literally a bug class that they get to just stop thinking about. Um, so uh, for IT, um, and kind of how you think about internal tooling. Beyond Corp is really cool. You're not Google, unless you are Google, in which case, great. Um, yes, build stuff like it's internet facing. Maybe don't actually put it on the internet. Um, you know, Beyond Corp was partially a way for Google to hold itself hostage to a very high bar when they knew that that was effectively already their um, risk structure. That is probably not actually your risk structure, and you are probably not also in a position to actually meet that risk structure unless you too have multiple 500 plus person security teams running around, in which case, awesome. Um, also, different users have different risk levels. Don't treat all of your users in the same way. Um, you know, you have users who really want local admin, and then you have executives. Unfortunately for some of you, those people may be the same. Um, tell them no. Uh, you know, harden the boxes that you really need to harden. Give people second machines for really high exposure tasks. Um, harden your office infrastructure because it will get you owned. Uninstall Word. If you can do one thing other than stopping phishing attacks, uninstall Word and Acrobat and Excel because those are the three things that will get you owned. Um, uh, simplicity, right? Capability is a liability. Every line of code that you have, don't think about lines of code as resources. Think of them as, as spend, right? Oh, we spent 50,000 lines of code to get this customer feature. The less code you have, the less code you have that can be owned. Um, delete data. Del data that you do not have cannot be breached. Um, servers that you do not have cannot be, cannot be breached. Um, if you are writing any kind of like wire protocol, including like API calls, et cetera, the simpler you make that format, the less likely it is to get you in trouble. Do not write Turing complete protocols. There is never a reason to have them. Unless you're literally intending to ship around mobile code, don't ship around mobile code with a really weird API that is what you thought was a string parser. Um, adversaries like your, excess, your excess capacity. Anything that you have that you don't actually need for running the production environment is a gift to your adversaries. So again, resilience. Um, all of your systems are made of humans. When something breaks, the way you fix it, unless it's a break that you expected, right? But that's not, that's not actually an incident, right? That shouldn't be an incident. That should be, oh yeah, this thing checked in and then the, the automation kicked in and whatever, it fixed it, right? Um, when you have something actually go wrong that you didn't expect, your ability to fix that depends on the humans running this system. This means do not run your teams at 110%. 
make sure that people take their fucking vacations, because if they do not take their fucking vacations, they are going to be burnt out and not willing to work late, and you have no adaptive capacity left. You do not have a resilient system. Um, so designing your systems to enable the humans and then giving the humans the slack in their schedules is a big part of how you actually get resilience. Um, do not include foot guns in your application environment, right? Do not include untyped variables or languages that support untyped variables or dynamic typing. Do not include unmanaged memory. It is a mistake. It's fine, you can still write Python, just turn on all of the type enforcement. Um, if you have foot guns, you need to document them universally, right? If you have things that are laying, this is the other thing that you put in that security design document, is a list of all of the foot guns that must be avoided in the execution environment. It's probably gonna be a long list if you haven't thought about your application environment in this way. Um, the reason why you put that list in there is to embarrass yourself into making it shorter because that is what will let your engineers write better code. Um, orchestration, automation is great sometimes. Um, keep humans in the loop whenever you can, otherwise your automation is just a tool that an adversary can use to manipulate your system in ways that you maybe didn't intend them to. Um, especially around security responses, do not have automated security responses that like, I don't know, burn out production hosts that you think are compromised, because that's a lot of fun to play with. Um, documentation is also a key feature for resilience. I will skip over this because whatever, it's documented in the slides. Um, and blameless engineering. If you fire people when they make mistakes, you will never hear about mistakes. You will never hear about the thing that is going to get you owned. Do not do that. Thank you. <laughs>